Thank you so much for coming and welcome to the second annual Watson Student Advisory Council undergraduate speaker series. My name is Laila Rodenbeck and I will be the host for today's event. Before we begin, I would like to thank everyone who made this series possible, especially Anissa Nestor for her mentorship and Dana Sutcliffe for her help with promotion. Above all, I would like to thank our three amazing speakers who coincidentally represent three different classes here at Brown. A big thank you to the three of you who during a busy in-person semester and midterms are using your voices to uplift these important issues and educate the broader Brown community. To give you a taste of what you will see tonight, each speaker will have 10 minutes to present, followed by a five minute Q&A. We encourage speakers to keep the answers concise so we can get to multiple questions. The event will also be recorded. Now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Ashton Lam. Ashton is a senior concentrating in international and public affairs and economics and comes from Pleasanton, California. Ashton has a burgeoning interest in climate change issues and their intersection with economics and public policy. The title of his presentation today is Climate Change, Catalyst and Contributor of Human Security Threats Among Vulnerable Populations. I'll let him describe his work further. Ashton, thank you. Hey everyone, um, hope your evening is going well so far. Thank you so much for coming in today. Um, also just wanted to thank the people at the Watson Student Advisory Council for all your work this past week and also for providing me the opportunity to speak today. Um, so like Layla said, my presentation will be titled Climate Change, Catalyst and Contributor of Human Security Threats Among Vulnerable Populations. Um, so much of what you'll hear today has been adapted from my uh, spring seminar that I took last semester with Professor David Pilati, Overcoming Threats to Human Security. Sorry, I'm just looking for the clicker. Um, if not, I can just I can just use a computer. All right. Um, so just a little bit about myself before I begin. Um, so my name is Ashton. I'm a senior. I concentrate in econ and IAPA on the development track. I'm from the Bay Area in California, and like I mentioned, um, a lot of this is taken from my junior seminar last semester. All right. So let's start with the basics. I think most of us in this room can all agree that the climate is changing. Um, the validity of and the evidence for such a statement is going to be beyond the scope of this presentation. But what I want to draw your attention to today is how we think about climate change. So when you hear about the word climate change, you know, oftentimes people think of images like this, of vulnerable species hanging on to fragments of the remaining habitat. Or people might think of big weather events, like storms or fires. If you were here in Providence over the summer, you might have seen some of that smoke blowing over from Arizona um, from some of their fires. And for these two cases, the connection to climate change is very apparent. But what if I were to say that an issue like the Syrian conflict also had its roots in climate change? Now that's not as easy to prove, right? But that's what I'm going to explain today in this presentation this relationship on climate change and vulnerable populations. So I'd implore you all to think of climate change, yes, as an issue of physical and biological concern, but more of an issue, at least for these next couple of minutes, as an issue of chronic human vulnerability. In this presentation, I'll cover three mechanisms in which climate change directly impacts and direct indirectly impacts vulnerable populations um, through some of its physical effects, its impacts on governments and impacts on humanitarian actors. So starting with the direct impacts that climate change has on vulnerable populations, the most obvious of which is sea level rise, which as its name implies is going to affect countries in low lying areas the most. By 2050, the World Bank predicts that over 140 million people will be forced to migrate due to climate change induced sea level rise. Um, so countries like the Philippines on the far right and the Maldives, which is covered by that gold star, um, are going to be in serious jeopardy because they risk having big portions of their country or even their entire country washed away. So this is a modern day image of the island of the Maldives. As you can see, it's very low lying. 
people don't really have many places to go if the sea level were to rise, let's say, one meter. And so the president has already begun negotiations to move its population of about 400,000 people to neighboring countries. Climate change also increases the severity and frequency of big weather events. So things like typhoons, hurricanes, droughts, and fires, um, climate change will exacerbate those challenges. It's not only going to displace millions of people, but it's also going to exacerbate existing food insecurities. So for example, drought-induced locust swarms in East Africa severely impacted their agricultural output. One thing that I do want to point out in this presentation is that even within vulnerable populations that are already at higher risk to the effects of climate change, women and girls are more at risk. Um, so this comes from the fact that women and children comprise the vast majority of people who are displaced by climate-induced disasters, but also because of the fact that agriculture as a sector that's most impacted by climate change and is the one that women depend on the most in developing countries. So climate change could really have far-reaching implications in things like sex trafficking, in gender-based violence, and also in women's participation in education. The key takeaway from the past couple slides is that the mere physicality of climate change is going to, um, is going to provide enormous challenges for these vulnerable populations, especially for people who are already mired in humanitarian crises. The next thing I want to talk about is the indirect impacts that climate change can have through governments. And one example of this is through access to fresh water. Climate change is going to reduce the amount of fresh water that's available for human use. And as you can see on this map, um, the countries highlighted in light blue are the ones that either are currently experiencing or are at risk of experiencing severe water shortages in the future. Um, this tension has already culminated in some uh, conflicts between as they seek to get fresh water for their populations. So China, um, for example, over there on the right-hand side of this map, um, has diverted a lot of the Mekong River Delta for its own agricultural purposes. And this has led to tensions with downriver countries like Vietnam, Laos. And so water is not only a source of conflict, but it's also you know a way for groups to use to um, advance their own political and military objectives. Um, here is a case study of how water has been used in the Middle East, um, starting with 2007, um, in which the Middle East has been struck by a very intense drought. This fueled food shortages and population pressures, um, contributing to things like the Syrian civil war. Syrian civil war in the context of agricultural um, crop and a lot of migration to the cities promoted the um, protests that were occurring in 2011, which culminated in armed um, uh, uprisings and the Syrian conflict. So that's not to say climate change is the sole cause of the Syrian conflict, but it is indeed a factor. Um, in 2014, and this is a pattern that we've seen a lot in the past decade, water has been used as a weapon of terror. So groups like Boko Haram, and ISIS have both strategically captured water resources in order to use it against their rival groups or their target groups. A common thread among these examples is that at the crux of the issue, vulnerable populations are going to bear the burden of these state conflicts. Um, just last year in 2020, um, Turkey was responsible for delivering water resources to Kurdish troops and camps in northeast Syria but weren't able to do so because of the water shortages. Um, and that significantly compromised humanitarian operations there and it comes to show that populations are the ones that are facing the brunt of these consequences. And finally, I'm going to cover the indirect impacts that climate change can have through humanitarian actors. Um, the main you know, point that I want to cover here is that climate change itself um, or climate change itself presents an issue that many humanitarian actors are not necessarily best prepared for. Um, in terms of funding, the amount that organizations require to fulfill their duties has risen 300% in the last decade. And this corresponds to the increasing number of people in humanitarian crises and also the increasing duration, frequency, and severity of such crises. 
even organizations like the United Nations have struggled to allocate sufficient funds for the island nations that we've discussed earlier to prepare them for sea level rise. Um, and even putting funding aside, um, I think one of the main issues that humanitarian actors face is inherently structural. So a lot of the aid that is given out today is more palliative rather than something that actually addresses chronic human vulnerability. A good case in point here is in Fiji in 2009, was struck by a big storm. And in the aftermath, a lot of organizations rushed in to rebuild their homes without actually um, providing any form of enhanced resiliency or making structures that could make their homes last longer in the face of newer storms. So going forward, it's definitely important for these organizations to be forward thinking and to incorporate emergency preparedness in order to anticipate the storms and disasters that will come in the future. And all this is to say that um, climate change, of course, is a global and multifaceted issue. Yet we've seen through the past couple of slides that climate change has a very nuanced effect and very differing and compounded impacts on vulnerable populations. So in our discourse in the future, we can't forget that climate security at the end of the day is also an issue of human security. Um, so these last couple of slides just summarize some of my recommendations that I detailed in my paper. Um, I will go through them rather quickly to spare you the time, but I'll start with recommendation number one, which is to formalize the status of climate refugees. Essentially, the United Nations is going off their definition of refugees as described in a 1950s document, very outdated and not accommodating to the circumstances of today. And so legal infrastructure would compel nations to be more accommodating for people who claim to be climate migrants. The second recommendation is to leverage public-private partnerships more. Um, for example, the 2019 Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance um, network has tremendous potential in connecting institutional investors um, and their capital to decarbonization efforts. I think there's a lot of you know, potential to expand the breadth of investors and also the investment opportunities within this group. Third would be to fully incorporate gender equality into climate work. Um, so this is you know, beyond just having equal representation on discussions on climate change. It's also about having frameworks to evaluate programs that receive funding so that they benefit equal numbers of men and women. Um, another important uh, note here is that the United Nations needs to incorporate and consider gender non-binary individuals and other people of LGBTQ identities such as transgender people who are often barred from receiving humanitarian or social services. And finally, the last recommendation here is to modernize the approach to climate relief. So like I mentioned before, um, groups need to consistently integrate more long-term data into their planning and have you know, equal efforts, disaster relief and emergency preparedness so that they can deal with the storms and the disasters that will arrive in the future. Um, so that's all I had today. Thank you so much for listening to my presentation. Um, we can open it up to questions now if anyone has anything to ask me. Andrew? Yeah, so basically the asylum process is if someone is seeking asylum, um, the host country or the, the country that they're attempting to arrive at, um, their courts will determine whether they are granted, you know, such a status. Um, a lot of those courts defer to UN definitions um, as outlined in their 1951 convention. And so um, if that, you know, infrastructure was there, the courts have a precedent, um, you know, to recognize these asylum seekers as climate refugees. Um, climate refugees could be something as evident as someone whose home was flooded and you know became overrun by water. It could also be um, like an island area where people come from. Perhaps there's a long drought and they can't have they can't produce any food, and so they might want to um, seek asylum elsewhere. <coughs> yeah, in the back. As a follow up to that, how do you differ between you know those who 
are refugees of accidents that natural disasters that were mm -hmm. caused by climate change versus ones that may have existed for millions of years and still continue to yeah. happen? And does that yeah. distinction even matter? Yeah. I would say that distinction does matter because one of you know the two is an occurrence that we've all seen throughout our lives, whereas the other one is a more new phen phenomenon. The idea of a climate refugee is very fluid at the moment, and it's like as I said before, there is no one definition yet, um, but all of it can be considered you know under the umbrella of climate refugee. So, for example, if there's like more intense storm or a more intense drought that might induce people to move. Yes, it could be something that we've seen before, but that's also, you know, a valid reason for someone to claim um, status as a climate refugee if their original homes become inhabitable. Yeah. Um, in your presentation, I noticed that. Well, oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I noticed that one of the maps you displayed um, evidently showed that disproportionately the countries and regions that were more affected by climate change were those of the global south. Yes. Um, however, you know, it is well known that uh, because of global warming, communities of color are proportionally, uh, I mean, disproportionately marginalized and, mm -hmm. and affected by this. I was wondering if in your research, uh, maybe if it's specific to the U.S., you came across this conclusion and if you had any remarks that you wanted to make about that. Yeah. You're absolutely right in that a lot of the places that will be more um, severely impacted by climate change fall in the global south, those developing countries. Um, for the purposes of this paper, I focused on countries outside of the United States, so I did not specifically um, research too much in the United States. One theme, though, was that even across countries, um, you know, those with higher incomes and those with higher or more developed infrastructures are obviously more adapted to take on the climate challenge. Um, within you know, those countries, I would assume that there are still are those disparities. If a storm hits you know, a developed country, let's say um, like a European country, the United States, there are still those disparities among people who receive those aids, um, those forms of aids, whereas people who don't. Yeah, so just like in the debate about climate change and like what is best to do, I guess mm -hmm. like an emerging field that I've been paying attention attention to personally has been like listening to indigenous frameworks and indigenous voices on how to manage climate change and also how to manage humanitarian aid. Do you see that maybe potentially becoming more popular? Yeah, no, that is a really good point because a lot of the humanitarian work that goes on now um, takes place behind you know closed doors where people who don't really have a connection to the people that they're serving are making the decisions. Um, it's been very clear in a lot of disease outbreak humanitarian efforts. The one that's coming to mind for me is the Ebola outbreak, where um, a lot of people who are engaging in aid didn't respect um, you know indigenous customs and cultural you know norms of the region that they were serving. It's super important for those organizations to incorporate you know how might their interactions and how they present themselves going to affect you know, how the people of the region would respond to such aid. Um, I don't know particularly if that research um, is like on the rise or if it's currently like you know still in development or if it's burgeoning, but I would definitely you know want to look more into that because it's definitely a very pertinent issue in regards to humanitarian aid. Awesome. I'll hand it back over to Leo. So our next speaker is Asa Turok. Asa is a sophomore at Brown, concentrating in political science, and hails from Salt Lake City, Utah. He speaks today on a topic that is extremely topical within current U.S. politics. The title of his presentation is How to Join QAnon. Thank you so much, Asa. You have the floor.
Okay. So just a clarifying detail just at the onset of the talk. We're not going to be handing out clipboards or anything. This is not like that type of how to join QAnon talk. Um, I am going to tell you how you ultimately could join QAnon and why that's important. But what really interested me about this topic is what drove people to this conspiracy and why it has become so prevalent in our politics. So I, my guilty pleasure is watching right-wing media pundits. I don't know what it is, maybe the reality TV principle of you know terrible behavior making you feel better about yourself, or my contrarian self, I'm a debater on the Myers-Briggs personality test, but I love watching the likes of Ben Shapiro, Tucker Carlson, Jordan Peterson, Stephen Crowder, you know, do their thing. So when I first heard this story of QAnon, I thought I'd see what all the fuss was about. I hopped on the World Wide Web Super Information Highway, and you know, to my surprise, I found nothing. A Google of QAnon will bring you to basically mainstream news outlets criticizing the conspiracy theory. On Facebook, where it's supposed to be kind of the you know the hub of QAnon, you find you know harmful content warnings, and Facebook has pretty much struck all of their QAnon positive content off of the site. And so it kind of frustrated me. I'm you know like a tech savvy teenager. If I couldn't find this information, how are these people finding it? So this footage is from Dallas a few weeks ago, um, and it's a thousand QAnon supporters eagerly awaiting the re-arrival of JFK Jr. to announce his vice presidential candidacy with Donald Trump in the 2024 election. While we at Brown love our alumni, even we would not be showing up to this event. It's a, a little ridiculous. Um, JFK sh failed to show JFK Jr. and thousands of QAnon supporters walked home disappointed. And while it's easy to dismiss these people as some sort of town jesters, we shouldn't. Recent polling has shown 25% of Americans believe some form of the QAnon conspiracy. So how did we get to this point of popularity with QAnon? To explore that question, we're going to look at a brief history of the conspiracy. So here's a brief history of QAnon. So this all started on an internet forum called 4chan. Now 4chan is famous for its anonymous uh, part of the platform, which is where the anon comes from in QAnon. Basically, you can post on this forum anonymously, which causes people to post some pretty you know, heinous and non-politically correct things, uh, which is why the platform has thrived in the last 10 to 15 years. And Q is for the level of security, a security level clearance in the US government, which is held by 1.5 million employees. So in 2017, uh, a poster by the name of Q Clearance Patriot made a post calling for predicting that Hillary Clinton would be arrested in the coming days. She was not, and all of the QAnon you know, predictions have basically been proven false, and people continue to you know, persistently believe that the next one will be real and the next one will be real. So how does this, what is this message that is so uh, resonant with people? And it comes down to this. So this is the idea, Q's concept, is that the world is run by a cabal of pedophiles who are celebrities and Democratic politicians, and basically that military generals sought Trump out and convinced him to run for president to bring these people to justice. That's the basic tenet of the conspiracy. And it basically started on this website, website 4chan, and then was kicked off and re-emerged in 4chan times 2, which is 8chan, which is kind of times 2 of the you know, heinous content. And then that was shut down, and it now finds its home on a website called 8coon, which is, you know, has over 1.5 million posts in its topic of QAnon research, um, of people basically doing their own research for the movement, which is a lot of people. Um, so why do people believe this outlandish conspiracy? So it breaks down to two reasons. And reason number one, I think, is this guy. So Q is not the inventor of the American conspiracy theory. But most Americans, regardless of class or education, could discern if something was too crazy to be true. But when word broke out that Jeffrey Epstein, a man with well-documented access to the most powerful politicians, celebrities, and billionaires in the world, 
was behind a child sex trafficking operation, this changed. Nothing now was too crazy, far-fetched, or evil to believe. It shifted the paradigm for conspiracy theories. And QAnon was able to take advantage of this hysteria and um, channel it in different, so in more mainstream social media platforms. So this became possible in Facebook with the hashtag Save Our Children. This was basically a co-opted um, hashtag which was meant to fight child trafficking that you know Q supporters uh, took over and using the algorithms, anytime a concerned parent would like a post from this hashtag, they would receive more and more content from the hashtag. So that could start off with a rather innocent concerned parent liking a post about child trafficking and turn up with you know a post about Hillary Clinton wearing a child's face as a mask like you know it got really crazy and um, <laughs> so that was a way that it really gained traction and then another way on social media so this is Facebook's um, statement where they basically removed the hashtag um, which was very important and kind of shut down the activity on the website and then th another way was through these like very innocent looking Instagram ads like if you look at this ad <laughs> It's kind of like the things that we see every day that are promoting various harmless causes, except this is about QAnon. And so it was able to spread and reach these wide reach of concerned parents through this messaging and is why it's basically so prevalent today. So you can see basically this middle column. Um, and pre-COVID had a huge impact on QAnon membership. So before COVID, you can see there was 7,400 Facebook posts a week related to QAnon. And then from March to August, which is when this article was published, 66,000 posts a week. So basically, like a lot of parents concerned about masking their children, vaccinating their children, found a community and solace in the QAnon community. And it just basically ballooned from there. So why does this matter to our contemporary politics? So National Republicans don't have much of a platform in the upcoming 22 mid 2022 midterms. Republicans will have to walk the tightrope between the Trump worship of the last four years and the moderate voters who want to forget about the shame of the January 6th insurrection and Trump's presidency without any new proposals or talking points besides Democratic incompetency. But Q has given them a motif, saving the children. If Political comparison to the Nazis is the worst accusation a political movement can draw. Jeopardizing the well-being of children is easily second place. We love children. They're so darn cute. Republicans are losing the culture wars, but it seems they're starting to find their strong point with Save the Children. So this is Glenn Youngkin, who defeated the Democratic incumbent a few weeks ago in Virginia, um, a state where Biden won by 10 points. So this is a pretty surprising victory for him. And basically the way he did it was not wanting to run a Trump-loving campaign in a blue state um, and having little to no policy from his own party to tout. Youngkin made the Virginia, Virgin, <laughs> Virginia gubernatorial, <laughs> um, gubernatorial race about kids. He made it about you know, schools denouncing critical race theory being taught in schools. and you know, a, a local sexual assault case in a Virginia high school as a re reason for preventing transgender youth students from using their restroom of choice. And so you can see Youngkin held these parent rallies. You can see the signs like parents for Youngkin and the, the tagline is our kids can't wait. Basically, this was what led him to victory in the state. Um, and so Republicans on a national scale have seen Youngkin's success and are looking to implement it in these upcoming midterms. So. This was basically um, parents at a school board meeting protesting the use of the book Beloved by Toni Morrison in the curriculum. Um, so yeah, this is another example on a national level. So this is J.D. Vance, who's an Ohio Senate hopeful, um, you know, calling out the childless left, um, citing Pete Buttigieg and Kamala Harris, people who do not have children, as um, examples for why Democrats should not be making policy for those that do and uh, proposing a system under which parents receive a vote for every child they have under the age of 18. Um, this is House Speaker Kevin McCarthy proposing a parent's bill of rights, which would basically like uh, 
give parents control over what was being taught in their schools. So it's not like they're directly, um, you know, directly endorsing the QAnon-based theories, but Republicans are hopeful that showing themselves combating liberal agendas in schools will translate to QAnon supporters conflating this fight to a deep state propaganda fight, imposing its will on their children, and re resulting in a high turnout in the upcoming midterm. So you can see basically QAnon has identified the importance of like local school boards um, and are trying to basically infiltrate those and get on those to make decisions about masks, mandates, and critical race theory. And this is a recent article from NBC News talking about how this is going to be used in um, the upcoming midterms, and it's all kind of under the guise of saving our children. So this brings us to the meat and potatoes of the talk, why you all came today, um, and how does one actually join QAnon? And it's, it's pretty simple. I'm going to break it down for you. One is that you download basically a deep web browser. Um, two, you go to this website called 8 Coon where you can check out all the latest conspiracy theories. These are kind of what the posts will look like. Um, they're pretty, pretty far-fetched. The middle is kind of like the AP QAnon study guide. Um, and then you can take the oath, uh, which is what Michael, General Michael Flynn did as pictured, um, which is basically where we go on, we go all. So why did I just tell all of you impressionable youths how to join <laughs> QAnon? Um, and the reason is, it took me hours of research to start to understand the depth of the conspiracies relating to QAnon. As Q likes to say, I went down the rabbit hole, studying conspiracies about Pizzagate, Jewish banking families, vaccines, Dominion voting machines, and started to see patterns. I now understand the vocabulary. Like, I can speak QAnon. Like, 17 is the 17th letter of the alphabet. That is Q. HRC is a reference to Hillary Rodham Clinton. An FF is like a false flag, which QAnon supporters would argue is what the January 6th insurrection was, basically the deep state blaming something on QAnon supporters. And then where we go one, we go all, which is the main slogan of the movement. Um, when we are able to like realize, uh, you're getting acquainted with these theories, you know, it'll help you recognize when Republicans are flirting with the conspiracy, um, you know, dis disguised as something else, like when Glenn Youngkin in the recent race uh, accused his opponent of using George Soros-backed allies basically to get out the vote, or you know Donald Trump referencing QAnon-specific uh, claims against specific election workers in the call with Georgia lawmakers from last year. And so ba we need to be able to realize when these dog whistles are happening because the QAnon supporters definitely are. And so basically, what we have to do is debunk these conspiracy theories as much as we can. It's incredibly difficult to reach QAnon supporters so deep down in the rabbit hole, but it can be done. Um, Jitarth Jadega um, was a fervent supporter of Q who would sit at his computer for weeks trying to decode the messages of Q and studying these boards. And one day, a Q user basically asked Q to verify that Trump knew about uh, the deep state and what was going on by getting him to say the phrase tippy top in uh, one of his upcoming speeches. And Trump said the word, and the QAnon boards rejoiced. And then um, Jadega stumbled upon a YouTube video, which was basically something like this. And everything was tippy top. I like tippy top. I like every, everywhere that goes to my buildings or my clubs says tippy top, right? Tippy top. Trump says the word a lot. He likes to say the word. This is from 2016, which is before QAnon was ever a thing. And basically, it, it convinced him to end his addiction to Q. Like, we should be at Brown and you know, educated young people, we should be the ones making these videos. By shining a light on this dark region of the internet culture, we can reach and learn how to combat its rhetoric and recognize when co coded Republican attempts to endorse it. Thank you. I believe we have some time. Yeah. yeah. So we have a few minutes for questions, if there are any. Sure, yeah. Um, when you were talking about vaccines, did you say deep state or deep state? Yeah, so that is a great question that is you know, very much at the heart of a lot of things being discussed right now. I would say in this particular case, 
um, the decisions that were made to deplatform QAnon were ultimately not helpful. There was a recent study basically done um, at Harvard which showed that uh, it's, it's complicated because a recent study at Harvard sh did show that people were less likely to find um, the conspiracy theories because they weren't on sites like Facebook. But it also creates a sort of rabbit hole where no one can, where there's no dissenting opinion once you actually get to these message boards. It basically makes it so that everything that's being put on there, once someone finds it, seems like the truth. So for that reason, I think it, what would have been a better move is to, is basically what I'm proposing here of, you know, going, researching it, debunking it, and if it was still on these mainstream platforms, more people would be able to do that regularly. But it is a very complicated issue. Yes? Me? Or yeah. Yeah, so I've read that similar to many cults, um, it's really hard to reason people out of QAnon because they're not really attached to it for logical reasons. Like, they've already practiced that cognitive dissonance. <coughs> like, you know, trying to, like, reason by only facts oftentimes doesn't really work on them. So I was wondering, like, with that context, what else you think or that people like us should do? Yeah, great question. So that was a, there was a lot of stuff at the heart of this research that was about that. There are multiple kind of, like, communities on the Internet on Reddit called, um, like, Recovery with a Q in the middle and, like, cult headquarters that are basically devoted to getting family members um, disassociated with Q. And I was really curious about this, too. Because obviously, when people are, you know, even when you say that's not true, it's as stated as Snopes.com. Snopes like a QAnon supporter will tell you, Snopes.com is or is owned by George Soros. I I'm not gonna. They're just as biased as everyone else. Like the fact, the fact checking is part of the deep state. So it is really difficult to to reason with the people. And I and I looked for a lot of people who had left um, the movement of what they said. And the most um, resonant thing that someone said was basically the way that if you know someone and are concerned with them because you're just concerned about them being in this conspiracy, you can basically ask them, I'm worried that I know that you are trying to do the right thing, but I'm worried that you are putting all this work and research into something that is not, that what if this is not the right thing? Merely posing the question. And um, a main, like, a, I forget their name, but a large, like, thought leader in this who had previously left QAnon, basically their thing was, you know, you're looking for a crack. You're looking for a moment of hesitation. And by asking those questions instead of kind of, you know, berating a, someone with facts, you can maybe get that. But great question. Yes? Where do you see QAnon going like the next one, two years? And I mean, obviously, you know, like I'm interested in your take on like the effect of COVID, you know, do you think it's ephemeral? Do you think it's eternal? How you see it? Yeah, so yeah. the interesting thing about this that I didn't really, there's obvious, uh, there's a lot of research into QAnon, but Q himself, the initial poster, has not made a post in over 10 months. Of course, there are all these websites all over the, all over these boards that are like, count, the, like, it has been 10 months, 11 days, 23 minutes, and 15 seconds since Q was posted. Um, so they're eagerly awaiting their return, but um, I think the, it, basically the movement has now taken off on its own. So the JFK Jr. Um, rally was organized by uh, a user who I think their name is Magnetic48 that has started a following of their own. There are basically, QAnon is, like a, is what's called like a big tent conspiracy. So it welcomes basically all conspiracies into it. And I think that now that these that it basically unified this big group of people it's difficult to imagine that they're going to go anywhere for a while and i think that this they will continue to kind of grow their um movement on the dark web which is pretty insidious great question yes sort of in that vein i believe that some of like those lower level politicians actually buy what they're selling but like it's even hard to believe that someone like michael flynn actually believes and so do you fear a future at all where wiser GOP politicians kind of just lean into it to retain power? Yeah, so that's, I think that that is basically what will happen. And I think that, that education politics are a great way to, to group in people who got into QAnon out of concern for their children. 
Um, and so the, the education politics that the Republicans are going to be pushing in the midterms will be a great way to sort of softly endorse that um, ideology of, of brainwashing by the deep state without directly coming out and endorsing, you know, I support the ideas of QAnon. But even, you know, in my home state of Utah, we have a represent national representative, Burgess Owens, who, you know, went on a, a QAnon podcast and basically when he was running, like there are very subtle ways that mainstream politicians are doing it. Um, and that's part of no why knowing these things and like speaking the language of it all, you can tell when someone is really trying to appeal without stating it explicitly. Great question. Thank you so much. So our next speaker is John Lin. John is a junior from Sugarland, Texas, concentrating in health systems and policy and biology. His talk today was inspired by the recent implementation of price transparency requirements for hospitals by the United States Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. The title of his presentation is Price Transparency in Healthcare Problems and Solutions. John, the floor is yours. Hi everyone, my name is John Lin. I'm a third year student uh, speaking about price transparency in the United States. So I've conducted a few studies on this topic and I'm really excited to talk to you about it. So for a brief introduction of my collaborators, um, Sophia Gowry, huge help, uh, is a student partner of mine. And then Paul B. Greenberg. Uh, Dr. Greenberg is my research mentor. He's an ophthalmologist in the Department of Veteran Affairs. He's a professor at Brown, and he serves as the Deputy Chief Academic Affiliations Officer for the entire Veterans Health Administration. And then Dr. Scott and Dr. French are two other collaborators of ours. One is at Penn State College of Medicine, and the other is at Northwestern University. They're very instrumental in helping us with study design. So for a brief introduction to the issue at hand, healthcare prices are extremely expensive in the United States. In this study uh, conducted by Dr. Ja, Dr. Shish Jha at the Brown University School of Public Health, they found that the United States has the highest healthcare spending in the world. But I don't think that surprises us. What does surprise us, however, is the fact that we have a similar level of social spending and a similar level of healthcare, util healthcare utilization compared to other developed countries. So using this OECD data, they found that Americans are not more unhealthy than other people, which is what a lot of people have been saying is a reason for high healthcare spending. In fact, it's because the prices we pay for the same services as other countries, those prices are higher. And that's the real reason for healthcare costs. And so what that suggests to us is that the way we can decrease healthcare spending is by decreasing those prices. And one solution that has been endorsed by Republicans and Democrats is using price transparency. The idea is if you make prices available for healthcare services, people will choose the cheapest prices. And this allows for capitalism to uh, work its magic and suddenly prices will decrease. So that's, that's a theory behind it. And based on this theory, the US Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services implemented on January 1st, 2019, a requirement that all hospitals publish a charge master, which is a list of charges for healthcare services. Well, that didn't work very well. So then they came with a new idea implemented on January 1st of this year to require hospitals to disclose standard charges for 300 shoppable services. And so it includes these charges that are on this page, gross charge, discount cash price, payer-specific negotiated charges, which you'll see in my presentation, it just means the charges that insurance companies have negotiated. And so the penalty for not disclosing these prices as required is $300 per day. And if you violate it every day for a year, that's $109,500. So that doesn't sound like a lot because these hospitals earn a lot of money, millions, 
you know, hundreds of millions of dollars even in some cases, why should they care if they have to pay $300 per day? And the only enforcement is that CMS would audit a sample, so a small group of hospitals, and investigate any complaints that are sent their way. So there wasn't very strong enforcement of this, the penalties weren't very severe, so we, we don't see, we don't expect to see a whole lot of disclosure. And so that's what we researched in this study. We researched um, exactly how effective these price transparency requirements were. So recently, the Biden administration, as of around two weeks ago, proposed a new rule that will be effective on January 1st of 2022. It increases the maximum penalty to $5,500 per day, which is a very steep increase from $300 per day. And it adjusts that based on bed count. So smaller hospitals get a smaller penalty, larger hospitals get a larger penalty. And the second and more important aspect of it is that it bans barriers to patient access. And I'll talk about why this is so important later. But essentially, a lot of these hospitals, in order to access their price information, require you to confirm that you're not a robot, which is so annoying. It's literally on everything, it's very annoying. And then they also require you to agree to terms and conditions in a legal disclaimer. Basically, you're signing away your rights to view prices. It's ridiculous. It just serves to intimidate patients from viewing this data. So the first study we conducted was looking at prices of cataract surgery and laser posterior capsulotomy at academic hospitals in the United States. And there's a reason why we chose these two services. Well, first of all, my mentor is an ophthalmologist. But second, um, the main reason why we chose these two is because those two were two of the shoppable services that were required for disclosure by the US centers, by the US CMS. And so theoretically, if everyone was following the law, doing what they're supposed to, there should be a 100% disclosure rate. Well, that's not what happened, as we'll find out. But um, in order to identify this, we had to systematically review hospital websites. We had to go to each hospital's website, identify the charge master, and see um, what the price was. So we did that in September of 2021. We recorded cash and insurance prices, and we identified barriers to charge master access. And so this here is a table sort of summarizing our results. As you can see, very few hospitals were fully compliant with the CMS regulations. Most of them provided some sort of cash price for cataract surgery or for LPC, as uh, I'll call it, for brevity. But most did not disclose prices uh, for insurance uh, prices for either of these. And regardless, the rate uh, at which people were transparent is really low. I mean, 72% seems high relative to the other numbers in the study, but it really should be 100%. It does not cost that much to disclose prices on a website. It's really simple. You're just posting your prices online. The other thing that was very important was that most price transparency tools that we did find included barriers on accessing prices. For example, they had anti-automation software, which was really annoying for us because we had to go in and we had to like click multiple times. We had to find like different insurance companies. We had to find different cash prices, different services. And they would block us from doing that because they would treat it, if you were trying to find something on the website, multiple times they would say, oh, you're a robot. You're like surfing the website. And it, it made it really difficult to kind of conduct this research. But I can also imagine for patients, it's also really difficult to access this data. Um, if there are these barriers, they're like, you can't access this data, you're a robot. And you're like, no, I'm not a robot. <laughs> so then study two, we conducted another analysis based on transparency for price, for, for cash and insurance prices. And so we recorded these hospital characteristics from the American Hospital Association and Turquoise Health, which is a database of healthcare prices. So we found that there were very few differences between hospitals based on price transparency. Meaning that if a hospital is price transparent, or if it wasn't price transparent, there is very little difference between them. Uh, in terms of almost every metric that we found earlier, the only difference that we did find was that in terms of cash prices, hospitals with more full-time employees were more likely to disclose prices. But the reason why that's significant is because if there's no difference based on hospital beds, why is the Biden administration giving smaller hospitals more leeway in not following the law? Why are they giving them smaller penalties? 
the Biden administration was convinced of this approach because the American Hospital Association lobbied very hard for it. They were very opposed to price transparency. They actually went in this lawsuit all the way up until December 31st, 2020, the day before the price transparency was upheld in a US, I think, second court of appeals ruling, uh, the American Hospital Association versus Alex Czar, uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services. They went all the way to like the second highest level of the judicial system in order to block this. Uh, and their main argument was their main argument was smaller hospitals have a larger burden. We show in this study that they actually have a similar rate of price transparency. They follow the law at the, the same rate as larger hospitals. There's no real difference there. The other thing is that there was no difference based on that income. So if there's a difference in price transparency, the idea is that hospitals would be earning less money if they have higher prices. Well, if there is price transparency and prices aren't going down because that income isn't going down, then there's, there's a question about how effective that price transparency actually is. So then, study three, uh, we decided to take a different approach. Instead of looking at federal price transparency programs, we decided to look at state price transparency programs. And so we systematically searched the internet for the state government operated price transparency programs, and we reviewed the information available and reviewed the price variation. And we found that there were very, very, very few price transparency programs operated by state governments. In fact, there are only 11. And of those 11, only six included information on any ophthalmic services or eye surgeries, uh, eye procedures, and only one, only Nevada, reported prices for more than three ophthalmic services. So what that suggests to us is that most of these programs are not actually including a lot of relevant information for consumers. So why would a patient use something if they try it and it doesn't have the surgery they want, it doesn't have the procedure they want? And then of these 11, only three reported non-financial value metrics, which means when patients went there, did they like it, did they not like it? It's basically patient experience ratings. And those are really important if you're looking for a doctor, you wanna know other patients found the doctor helpful. And very few of these had that. And then five of these programs reported prices by clinician organization, which just means prices per hospital. So Maryland is the actual state that I'm talking about here that did not report this. They only gave a number for the entire state, the average cost of, uh, for example, cataract surgery. Most, most of the programs that did provide uh, information on ophthalmic services did provide this, but still, five out of 11, very sad. And then none of them reported out-of-pocket costs, which are very important because if you're a patient, you wanna know how much you're gonna pay. None of them reported insurance costs, which is very important because a lot of people have theorized the way price transparency programs actually reduce prices and healthcare spending is because insurance companies learn what the cheapest possible rate is and then they all negotiate for this lower rate. Well, suddenly you have more competition, you have lower insurance costs. Um, and so we also found there was substantial price variation, which again sort of shows that healthcare spending in the United States is like kind of random. It's not based on the actual cost of the procedure, but instead it's based on you know, how much market power does this hospital have? Because if they have more market power, they're gonna charge more. If there's only one hospital in your area, you have to go there regardless, and your insurance company has to cover it regardless. So we looked at the prior research on the efficacy of price transparency programs to see whether it aligned with what we found, and it did. Um, according to this study using from Safeway and Cigna, they found that having a price transparency program available did not lower healthcare spending at all. <laughs> there were no effects. But when it combined with reference pricing, that led to a 13 to 12, 27% reduction in healthcare spending. And what reference pricing is, is say there are three doctors in your area. One is cheap, one is expensive. Reference pricing states that if they all provide the same service and you don't go to the cheapest one, then your insurance company will pay the cheapest price and you have to cover the rest, the difference between the cheap and the expensive position. So you're, you're sort of left covering whatever is um, left. And that's pretty unpopular among most Americans, but it's the thing that actually reduces healthcare spending. And then another study looking at state level price transparency programs 
found that there was a 5% reduction in hospital charges. Now, 5% was statistically significant. And that is pretty important to do everything we can to lower these prices. But 5% is very, very small when you consider how high healthcare prices are in the United States. And it doesn't seem like these price transparency programs, as they're being run right now, are making a big impact. And one reason is because it is so difficult to look at these prices. As a researcher, going through these websites, it was difficult for me, and I'm pretty internet savvy. So the main issue here is that the US CMS required that hospitals disclose this on their own websites. So if you want to look at prices at you know, Rhode Island Hospital or Care New England Hospital, you have to search those up yourself. You have to find the website. And a lot of these websites are actually blocked from Google, so you can't actually find it looking through Google. It makes it incredibly difficult, um, and it's really not helpful. Instead, if CMS had created its own website in which all hospitals would have to submit their pricing information, then first, that allows them to report the currency of data. They know when the data is from. Second, that helps with enforcement, because CMS knows exactly who is not submitting the data. And third, it really helps patients, because patients can just go to one website and see all the hospitals in a 50-mile radius, instead of having to search up what well, hospitals in our 50-mile radius, and then trying to look at each price transparency tool. Second, it's very important to verify the accuracy of data. What we're seeing here is just what the hospitals are reporting. We don't know if it's accurate. And CMS has no plans to verify the accuracy, which is very problematic. Uh, another thing is to include common procedures. As I mentioned in the state level price transparency program, a lot of procedures that were very important were not included. And these are procedures that are, you know, millions of Americans undergo them every single year. It's very concerning. More information is very necessary. Um, Out-of-pocket costs, very key. Quality of service, co-payments. And finally, patient awareness of these programs needs to, needs to be improved. One study found that the New Hampshire price transparency program, which is actually the most detailed in the entire country, only 1% to 2% of people actually used it in the state which is a really, really low rate and definitely needs to be improved if you want to actually lower prices using a price transparency program. So here are our references. These are the studies that we cited. Uh, as you can see, that first one is the one I mentioned earlier with Dean Jaw. Uh, it's the one using OECD data to compare healthcare spending in the US and other high-income countries. But yeah, thank you so much. I'm not sure about other countries. I think the main reason it's such a big deal here in the United States is because for a long time, hospitals, insurance companies, they would keep these prices secret through these like special payer negotiated, you know, non-disclosure contracts where like you'd negotiate the price and then not tell anyone what the price was, which is what led to surprise medical billing uh, as like this huge political issue because people were getting billed like thousands of dollars for very simple procedures getting like a cotton swab at like NYU's hospitals costed like $50, which is like one cotton swab, $50, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, you had a question? Yeah, how do you think you can get more people to use a price, price transparency tools? Yeah, so um, there are a lot of things that they can definitely do. The number one thing, I think, is creating one central website for all this information nationwide. It's something that the Trump administration didn't do, I think, because the American Hospital Association was so opposed to it that they sort of just accommodated it. But it really decreases the utility of it. It makes it really difficult to access the data. The second thing is advertising it. A lot of people don't even know that this rule was passed. You know, 2017, 2019, you know, 2021, even the rules like right now, I am pretty sure like very few people know about them. So advertising that such a website did exist would really help. We have time for one more question. All right, thank you guys so much.
Thank you so much to our three speakers for your incredible work and to everyone for coming. Um, it's hard to believe that only an hour has passed given all that we've learned and the breadth of these presentations. And thank you to our audience for coming out tonight and for your insightful questions. And with that, I conclude the second Watson Student Advisory Council Undergraduate Speaker Series, an event that we hope to last several semesters into the future. Thank you so much.